Well, it's Friday night, so we know what that means. It's time to play with servers with Alex. I mean, I've had a lot of mail this week. I've got some replacement cables for the carry-on cables, one that had the 3.3 volt issue. That's going to go into the epic build and hopefully finally be the last power cable that I ever have in there. I have a replacement LSI 16 card here. So this is an HBA. This is going to go into Morpheus, the media server in here. Oh, somewhere upstairs, I have the fan and fan bracket that I 3D printed for the other one. I should probably run upstairs and get that before I install this. But this is the LSI 16 card that I was talking about that has 16 SATA ports on it. And I need about 12 of them for Morpheus. So uh, we're going to install that today too. And then uh, I've also this week got this absolute beefcake of a label maker. This is the Brother P-Touch Edge. It has a proper model number, uh, which is on Amazon somewhere, but not printed on the actual unit. It comes with a, a blown, like a massive, it's like a power tool, this thing. It comes with a great big blown plastic case, and you can put different size tapes in it to do different sorts, sorts of labeling, that kind of thing. So I've got a 24 mil tape here one inch tape there and then in the back of it i've also got a 12 mil tape which is perfect for doing things like patch panels and what have you and i'm going to relabel all of the cables in my comms rack up here because as you can see some of these cables are only a week old and they're already coming off so i want to make that i want to clean that up and make that look a little neater today and also actually put labels on these ones down here because i meant to do it a, a year a year ago but i never actually got around to it and then the final thing i want to show you is if i just well you can kind of see is my new chest of drawers <laughs> i went to lowe's and spent 150 bucks on a cheap metal set of drawers here and it's screwed into the wall and i have a screen and the grafana dashboard you know so this is like a proper little server room now i'm perhaps a little bit more excited about it than i should be but i find it exciting all right what can I say? So this little Craftsman set of drawers here was about $150. I've got my old ThinkPad X240 on top of it, hooked into an old 24-inch 1080p monitor at the top there. The plan here is I've also got a, an HDMI 2 or 1 in to 2 out splitter and a long HDMI cable. So I'm going to run the HDMI out from the KVM switch over there into this screen so that I don't necessarily have to have a laptop down here. I almost always do bring one down here when I come, but it's nice to have things on a screen sometimes, you know? And then the final upgrade, although I might do this one first, this is an upgraded CPU for the HL15. So you know the, the Xeon that shipped with it was a Xeon bronze six core weak source CPU, right? I've gone ahead and purchased off of eBay a Xeon Silver 4214 Xeon CPU. I can't remember the specs of it right now, but it's better. <laughs> it's a lot better than the one that shipped with the system. So I'm going to pull the, uh, the HL15 out of the rack and get that installed. I've also got a 64 gig RAM upgrade for the HL15 as well. It shipped with 32 gigs. I just bought another 32, I think. So that will take me to a, be a very nice, completely, totally overpowered test server. So that's the plan for this evening. Lots of upgrades, and I bring you along for the ride. So let's go. Right then, so the first thing we're gonna do is get the HL15 out the rack and install that CPU and RAM upgrade. Now this HL15 was shipped to me pre-assembled and I went to take off the heatsink just now and realized I need a T30, which is quite a beefy Torx bit. And the only one I have is one for working on cars. So <laughs> here we go. I am using a car-sized T30 half-inch ratchet to take the heat sink off. Because sometimes needs must, eh? Whoa! <laughs> Didn't expect that. Okay, this is my first time doing a, a Xeon CPU like this. I've only ever had CPUs that are 
socketed, you know, with the latches and stuff. Ooh, hope I didn't break anything. <laughs> it's a bit late now if I did. Uh, okay, so this this heat sink, uh, oh, it just kind of is like a tray that just sort of like clips off. Man, I am showing my naivety with this platform right here. I expected it to be just like the desktop chips. Ooh. All right, well, I managed to get it out with uh, a mixture of brute force and stupidity. Hopefully it didn't damage anything as I did it. Okay, put that over there. And grab the replacement. So there are some notches in the CPUs, which will help me line them up a little bit. You see here, there's a notch there and there, and then two on that side. Like I say, I am brand new at actually administering the CPUs on this platform. Right, I should probably clean off that uh, thermal grease that's on there. Expose that beautiful copper that is there. A little bit of isopropyl alcohol does the trick. Remember in the old days, I used to buy special thermal, thermal goop cleaner, and then I realized I was being taken advantage of. <laughs> And these days I just use isopropyl. Which I happen to have plenty of because I have a 3D printer. All right, so uh, I guess I put a bunch on the heatsink. Normally I put it on the CPU, but... God, I tell you, with these Epic and Xeon CPUs I've been working on lately, compared to all the desktop sized chips that I've had over the last decade plus well 20 years i guess <laughs> god getting old uh these things suck up a lot of grease i had like 10 tubes of grease uh, i'd accumulated over the last few years and it's it seems to be diminishing with these server chips i guess you buy it to use it don't you i'm kind of tempted to put the cpu in the socket first because in that way I can't screw up the keying. It's going to be much more difficult to bend a pin. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I've always done it with desktop chips. So I think that's the way I'm going to do it with this one too. I think it was this way around before. I don't know if that matters, but I'm going to just line it up with the pins on the corner. Put the heat sink back in place then get my super mega jumbotron wrench over here and just start tightening very gingerly following the one two three four pattern that's on here just do a little bit at a time right well it's in i am absolutely convinced if you looked in any service technician manual you would never find someone telling you to do it the way i just did it let's try and oh i need to do the ram upgrade whilst i'm here as well the memory that i've gone for is sk hynix 16 gigabytes pc4 3200 you can see it's just secondhand stuff off ebay and uh, it's come from an hp server it looks like originally i just took a picture of what was the ships that sticked with <laughs> of i just took a picture of the sticks that shipped with this system and then bought a couple more that seem to closely match it so we'll see in a minute if if it works or not all right ram is done cpu is done let's power it up and see if i screwed anything up So the next thing I'm going to have to do here is log into the Unify system and turn the outlet back on because, for you know, if it's sitting there, it's going to just suck down a few watts with its IPMI and I'm really not going to be using it that much. So the general idea of the PDU was to reduce my power usage. Now, let's try and turn it, turn it on and see if it posts. Well, I don't know if this is good because it's a server motherboard. Maybe it would get this far with posting even with a bad CPU. Maybe not. I doubt it, actually. 
It's looking good so far, I guess. Right, let's just hop into the BIOS and verify that everything went well. Check we can see all of our memory and verify the CPU that I was sold is the CPU that I purchased. <laughs> and it's never a given on eBay, is it? Okay, CPU configuration. Uh, Xeon Silver, 4214. 12 cores, 12 threads, max turbo of 3.2 gigs, and a base processor speed of 2.2 gigs. It's going to be such a tasty upgrade over this bronze CPU, let me tell you. Uh, right, so we know that works. So let's head back to the BIOS and verify that our memory showed up. Is that on the main page? Total memory, 65. Okay, perfect. Yep, that's exactly what we wanted to see. So CPU and RAM upgrade seems to work work to treat, so... Let's discard changes and exit and boot into Proxbox and do a quick bit of stress testing. Right, so what I'm going to use for stress testing is an application called S2E, as S hyphen TUI, combined with stress NG, stress hyphen NG next gen, I suppose. Um, again, looking at the CPU temperatures, pretty good. 28, 27 degrees package temperature. Let's put it under, under some load and see what she does. Uh, all right. Jumping up to 39 Celsius, anything under 50, maybe even 60 is, is totally fine. With the airflow this case has and the temperature down here, I would imagine ambient temperature must be sort of 15, 16 degrees in this basement. So I'm imagining that this package temperature is going to stay pretty well below 50 degrees, although once it's heat soaked, you never know. Now, Stress NG is showing us a few things here. Uh, we can see, obviously, that the CPU temperature is 43 degrees, and then the average sort of core frequencies is 2.7 gigahertz. Now, it does turbo up to 3.2, like I said a few minutes ago. But, you know, be, being consistent at a certain frequency is more important than absolute performance, I would say, in, in, this, in this test, at least. All right, cool. So we'll leave that running for a few minutes. And I think it's probably time now to do the power cables in the Epic build, which is the one in the middle over here. Okay, time to remove the temporary power cable that I put in for that 14 terabyte drive that wasn't showing up because of the 3.3 volt issue. So if you, if you don't remember, when, when the shocking drives first came out a few years ago, there was a lot of furore about the 3.3 volt rail on some of these power cables showed you in the last video, but you can just about see, if I block my face, you can see here that I just cut the 3.3 volt rail on this one, and then I used a power splitter going out to the rest of the SATA power connectors. What I asked for from the carry-on cables guy was a power cable that had no 3.3 volt rail on it, such that it wouldn't cause me any issues with any shuck drives in this system. I don't intend to use a whole bunch in this Epic box, but you never know. Those Black, Day, Black Friday sales can be pretty darn tempting. And so here's, here's the cable that didn't work for me. And he sent me a new one. Let's get that. And we can see right away the difference here. So the, the new one is in this hand here. And here's the old one. So there are five wires on this one, four wires on this one, which hopefully means that there is no 3.3 volt power going through this cable, which is exactly what we want. So, plug this into one of the SATA peripheral ports here on my uh, Seasonic power supply. Route this in here. And then, it should just be a case of connecting up all of these different power cables. I cannot tell you how much easier that is than the mess that I had to deal with when I was trying to do it by myself. So, I think this power cable was about... $35, $40, dollars, something like that. Like I say, I'm, I'm in Raleigh, the, the gentleman's in Greensboro, so shipping was minimal. And it was very responsive, even though there was a problem with the order. Uh, very responsive chap. You'll certainly enjoy dealing with him. And I'll put a link to his stuff in the description down below. But here is his card. I always like it when small, people, small businesses do this. You know, it, um, it just shows that you're dealing with a human and not some massive corporation. I like this. Okay, cool. That should be done. I don't think there's anything else I want to touch in here for the foreseeable future, actually. So I'm going to go ahead and just put the lid back on and put it back in the rack and hope for the best.
All right, so I put the Epic server back in the rack for now. I'm just going to boot it up using PyKVM to check what's going on. I'm really enjoying this PyKVM business. Having this eight port switch that I installed last weekend, I've used it loads this week just to check on stuff. And I, uh, for some reason, decided it would be a good idea to re-IP a couple of boxes this week in my Proxmox cluster. <laughs> and I kind of ended up in a situation where I kind of locked myself out of things like a bit of an idiot. And so it was very useful to have this PyKVM to kind of bail me out of trouble, to be honest with you. I get a surprising amount of joy out of just watching these things boot and the text scrolling by. I feel like a real sysadmin right now. So let's do deep thought. Excellent. And then I'm going to use my old favorite Inksy just to check that we have everything we want. So we've got the 14, we've got the 16, and then we've got the 380, 418 terabyte drives. Perfect. Oh, 420 terabyte drives. What am I talking about? 420s, 116, and 114. The new power cable works. So that's great. That is that bit done. Right, so let's check in with the HL15 that's been burning in for the last 15 minutes or so. I think it looks pretty good, to be honest with you. The package temperature is sitting at a nice 56 degrees Celsius. The frequency is sat really stable at 2.7, 2.695. It just dropped to a little bit. But yeah, I'm going to call this good. I don't need to, I don't need to burn a bunch more electricity testing this. Just verify everything shows up as we expect in the operating system. 64 gigs of RAM and 24 threads. Yeah, perfect. All right, time to, time to power this guy off. Next thing we want to do is power off Morpheus. So I'm just going to go ahead and SSH in and power it off. Yes, the keen eyed amongst you will notice I switched it to NixOS this week. I don't know if I have NeoFetch installed. I'm almost sure I don't. But I'll just show you before I do power it off. That, by the way, is the power of Nix right there. I didn't have the NeoFetch package installed. So I jumped into a NixOS shell and installed the package NeoFetch. It downloaded all the stuff it needed to run NeoFetch. Okay, NeoFetch is a small application. And boom, I have this package now available for me to use. And... We can see we've got the i5-8500, we've got 64 gigs of RAM. It's been up for three and a half days, running kernel 6.1.82. And, oh yes, the magical NixOS 23.11. Now, I do have some plans for Morpheus this week. I just, I, I gave in. I, I have decided to upgrade Morpheus, and it's probably time for some real talk. My Epic Box... He's doing everything I need it to from a home lab perspective. In fact, for work today, I just spun up, you know, three or four different virtual machines and it was just a joy to work on. I edited all of the video for Tailscale on that, that machine today using a pair of four terabyte NVMe drives in a mirror, in a ZFS mirror, over the network. And I was getting 10 gig speeds, like completely maxed out, scrubbing around in the timeline felt not quite, but almost local. And so I'm really happy that that Epic box is kind of my production box for work. It is with the home lab box. I play around with VMs and testing stuff, whereas Morpheus is production, right? Pseudo prod, as I mentioned, you don't interrupt a three-year-old Peppa Pig. So what led me to buy the Epic box in the first place was I wanted to have a playground where I could do whatever I wanted and also happen to run all of my media stack. Well, as it turns out, Alex, if you want to play around and do whatever you want, that means you want to be able to reboot too. And so I needed to switch from one main server to two servers or, well, go back to two servers. And all of the issues that I talked about in the Epic video, things like PCIe lanes being a bit short, just mostly being a little bit short on PCIe lanes on the Intel platform. I've actually decided to go from Intel 8th gen, so the 8500, the i5-8500 CPU that's in there right now, all the way up to an i5 13600K and a super micro motherboard. Don't worry, I'll make a full video on the upgrade. All of those parts are currently in a UPS truck somewhere between here and Indianapolis, I think. So I'll be doing that in the next week or two. So I, I will actually be doing a proper media server upgrade that stays within the realm of the achievable human being and uh, bring you along for the ride, of course. But back to today, I want to install the LSI 16 port card and do some stability testing on it overnight. And uh, I guess that's what we'll do now. 
I've actually been really enjoying Nix OS um, this week. It's it's a real journey for me that I'm on with with Nix at the moment. I, I love the fact that it makes it more difficult for me to tinker and simultaneously easier to, to have a more stable platform. The, the main thing I don't like is that it doesn't appear in my Proxmox cluster of, of nodes. And sometimes it's just nice to see that little green tick, you know? <laughs> Maybe I'm being silly, but I just like it. I had a question in the comments of the last video. What do I do about dust down here? Honestly, it's, it's pollen season right now in North Carolina. And if you've never been here or lived in the East Coast or the sort of Southeast area, you won't believe what the pollen is like here. It is a thick dust that happens overnight, seemingly. I mean, we had biblical rain here in Raleigh the last couple of days. And I woke up this morning and the cars are completely covered in pollen dust again. It's almost unbelievable, really. So I'm going to pull out the HBA card uh, as I'm talking. Um, and the if, if the dust was going to go back to the dust question, if it was going to be a problem, it'd be a problem this week, right? Uh, where there's lots and lots and lots of fine particles in the air. And you can see really that, I mean, I had these servers out last weekend and there's a very, very thin, I don't know if that comes across on camera super well. There's a very, very thin layer of dust there. So the short answer is I'm not worried about dust. Uh, I've been running my servers down here in the open like this for the last five years. Humidity might be an issue, but again, I, I haven't actually had any issues with it. I have a temperature probe just on the side of my... Can you see that? No, not quite. Just there. I have a little ESP home-based temperature sensor that hooks into Home Assistant. And I monitor the humidity and it it fluctuates, of course, like some, sometimes it's up to 70, 80, 90% down here after it's rained really heavily. But for most of the time, it's in that sort of 40, 50% range, which is actually pretty good for servers. And I actually think that the servers themselves contribute a little bit to the humidity being good down here, keeping the airflow moving. And obviously they've got, you know, venting and stuff like that. And then also, as I'm sure you can see, the furnace is right there. So when that's running, obviously that's warming up the air down here and probably removing a little bit of the humidity it's not exactly what you'd call a textbook deployment is it down here but then again it is a home lab i'm not a data center i've thought about i've thought about building a false wall around this space um and i've got a little you know dehumidifier over there i've, I've thought about it but until i see an issue or have an issue related to those things directly i'm just going to leave it as it is and hope for the best Hope's a valid strategy, right? Now, the LSI card, I just remembered I didn't pick up the fan when I went upstairs a few minutes ago, so I'm just going to be you know, disappear upstairs for a minute, go and grab the fan, and I'll be right back. So this is the fan I was talking about. It's a, a Noctua Chromax NFA914 PWM uh, in black, and I 3D printed this little bracket, which just hooks on via friction onto the heatsink of the HBA card. I printed this out of PETG because it's a little more heat resistant than PLA, although honestly, I'm hopeful that it's not gonna get anywhere near temperatures that would cause an issue for PLA, but why risk it? All right, so put this into the server now. So now I've got the fan cable hooked up here to the motherboard. All that's left to do is hook up all of these SATA cables. And so on the end here, it's a, it's a connector I hadn't seen before. It's a it's like a pair of, of like, I don't know, it's like a game cartridge in the old days or something. It's an SFF something. I, I don't know what the model number is precisely without looking it up. And so I have 12 ports up the front here to fill up. So I have three cables and each cable breaks out into four SATA connectors. So, right, let's get the, go ahead and get this wired up. Right, and there we go. All of the drives are now wired up. We've got 12 different connectors over here and a spare 8-port HBA once again. I'm going to put that on my pile of attrition for this evening. And I suppose it's time to power it up and check that the HBA works, huh? So probably the easiest way for me to show you what's going on right now is to jump into Pi KVM and just check out what Morpheus is up to. Okay, he's doing his post thing right now. So once that's done, 
uh, we will check that the HBA card works as expected. In the meantime, though, I'm building a new server, right? And I like to name my servers after some of my favorite fictional characters. You've got Morpheus, Deep Thought. My backup server is called Anton, it's a Silicon Valley reference. Uh, Zoidberg, <laughs> name of my network appliance, right? Try to come up with a good... I mean, I think if I'm replacing the CPU or motherboard, I think that counts as a new a new brain, a new computer, right? So it probably needs a new... Morpheus is probably due for, due to go into retirement. So I have to think of a new name. Uh. Well, this is a good start. It's just imported all the ZFS pools. So I guess that means that the drives are showing up in the operating system, at least. So let's do... Morpheus this way. So let's connect into Morpheus via SSH. Do my favorite Inksy boy. Oh good, that looks like a lot of hard drives. Excellent. Uh, cool, Z pool status. I'm not gonna bother counting them. Not my three. Okay, so these SSDs don't, none of these SSDs count, but the ZFS up here, big rust 18. That counts, that's connected via the HBA. And then I guess, let's have a look at my FS tab. I've got five data disks. So if I just run mount here, actually I'll do a, a DF minus H. I wish the output was cleaner sometimes. You can see we've got disk one, two, three, four, and five. Excellent. So, so far so good. The HBA showed up. The acid test for the HBO overnight is I'm going to run... Uh, the thing that crashed it before was running a 3 or 4 terabyte ZFS replication. So I'm, I'll just replicate between Deep Thought and Morpheus. I'll replicate that 3 or 4 terabytes overnight and, and see what happens. So that upgrade is now done. I think we can call that good. Uh, time to move on to just a little bit of labeling. It's getting quite late, so I'm not going to do too much labeling now. But all of the hardware upgrades, dare I say... <laughs> Went off without a hitch tonight. So what have we done? I replaced the HBA card in Morpheus. I upgraded the CPU and RAM in the HL15. And in, ah yes, the power cable in the Epic build. I replaced that too. Yeah, it's a pretty good evening's work so far. Awesome. Right, cabling time. Time to look at this absolutely chungus label maker. Uh, I won't pretend to do a full rundown of it yet because I've, I've literally only had it for a couple of days. Um, but there's a video by Cameron Gray. I actually watched it on the plane back from the desert last week. It's about an hour long. <laughs> if you can believe there's an hour long video on a label maker. It has all sorts of really cool features. So it has a faceplate mode, a cable wrap mode, patch panel mode, punch blocks. It's got Wi-Fi. You can do serialization. It's got a keyboard so you don't it can connect to an app on a phone or a computer, but it doesn't need it. And that's where, this is my previous label maker, I just realized it's actually in shot. How convenient is that? Um, this brother label maker here is Bluetooth and it connects to an iOS app and it, it kind of does the thing a little bit, but I found myself, you know, it's, it's always the way when you're doing this kind of thing, like it, you're just long enough between making labels where this powers off to save energy or you need to use your phone for filming, right? And you think, oh, well, I don't want to... I just wish there was a keyboard on this thing. So that, that's really what this does. And it's built like an absolute tank. I mean, this is super solid plastic. It's got a rechargeable lithium-ion battery in the bottom there. It can also take... A really nice feature, actually. It can also take... Uh, what are they? Double-A batteries. Four double-A batteries down here. So that's a pretty cool feature. Was it four? No, it's six. Counting's hard, all right? <laughs> uh, six AA batteries, and then the tapes just go in the back here. So this actually, believe it or not, takes the exact same tapes as this P-Touch Cube Plus that I had before. And what that means I can do is, if I can remember how to open this thing, there we go, just swap the tapes willy-nilly between the boxes, which is actually pretty handy because I bought a bunch of tapes for this. So it came with a 12 mil tape, one of these flexible ID. So it came with a tape, a 12 mil flexible ID, and this is the one I'm gonna use for all of the cable wraps I'm about to do. Uh, actually, I'm gonna use the 24 mil flexible ID tape, sorry. Um, but this 12 mil one is really good for patch panels because it's just the right thickness. And then 
if you want a more traditional kind of laminated label, this is the beauty of the Brother ecosystem, right? It's all, there's, there's a million different types of everything. So really we, we can fit whatever we want, you know, our use case to be. There's going to be a label for it. All right, so let's make a couple of labels before we clock off for the evening. What's the first one going to be? It's going to be, uh, right, so I'm, I want to label Zoidberg first of all. Go in here and do that. Oh, just want a single line. Press print. And so it sort of half schools the label. It's one of the things I really like about this versus the, the P-Touch Cube thing. You can see it's printed out a really nice cable wrap that's in there. And I, normally you'd have to cut this to length yourself, but we actually do that. Look, it peels off beautifully. Okay, there's a little bit of waste, but honestly, these, these labels are really pretty cheap. They're a few dollars for a roll, and I think the rolls last quite a decent length of time at my, my sort of usage. So I'm just going to wrap Zoidberg neatly around, like so. I could have probably done a better job of that, but such is life sometimes. Uh, and there you go. So what's the next one? I think it's Home Assistant. So let's do Home Assistant next. I didn't actually label that one last time. Let's do Home. Because one of the things you have to be aware of is the width of the, the, width of the labels isn't actually that great. So I'm just going to do Home Assist on two lines and just see what that does. Again, it's going to print out at the top here, do the half score cut. And there we go. There you go. I mean, that, that does the trick, right? I, all I need to know is what device that power cable is connected to. I don't need it to be super duper beautiful. Okay, I'm not doing a very good job tonight. Maybe it's a sign that I'm too tired and should go in and stop pseudo working <laughs> like I am right now. It's been a long day. Shot and edited an entire video for Tail Scale, and uh, now I'm doing this one too for fun. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Okay, uh, I'll just show you very quickly before I go. I'll just show you the patch panel business that's in here. Uh, I don't know which, which port's going where, so I'm just going to waste some labels showing you this right now. So I'm going to put the 12mm flexible ID tape back in. That's how quick it is to change tapes, at least. And go back to hmm, patch panel mode. We'll clear the text, yep. Patch panel mode, 18.5mm. Now, I have this exact same patch panel in my um, bonus room upstairs, so I know the spacing is correct. Uh, I'll just do four blocks for tonight, and I'll just do... I don't know, cam one, use the arrow key to go to block two, cam two, test so that I know that I've just been messing about here, test one, and then test two, press print. And, you know, it's just going to print me out some really nicely evenly spaced labels right here. There we go. And you could spread these over multiple lines if, if you need to, for whatever reason. There we are. Doesn't that look good? Doesn't that look good? So it's about time I actually labeled things properly. Um, but I think we used to have a phrase in my family, I'm turning into a pumpkin. It's pumpkin o'clock, which usually means it's time for bed because Cinderella, I guess. Now, I am going to be doing a full video on the Morpheus upgrade. If you have any ideas for a name, I mean, I'm probably going to reject most of them because it's a very personal thing, but if you've got a good idea, let me know. And uh, if you want to see anything else about this rack, if you've got any further questions, I'll be doing a Q&A video fairly soon and, um, you know, stuff like the dust question and things like that. Uh, I had a few folks ask me various questions about different things going on. One of the things I actually noticed is that my OpenSense box here, now that I've got the PDU showing me all of the different power for every single device, my OpenSense box, I thought, drew like 10 or 15 watts. It draws nearly 25 watts. So it's an i3-3225, I think. 
very, very old system that's been with me for a very, very long time. So from a landfill, you know, e-waste perspective, it's good to keep it going, but the energy usage is just a bit higher than I would like. So I might look into replacing that soon. I also have my blue iris box upstairs, which I probably want to relocate into this rack, which might mean another Dell Optiplex gets put in here. So maybe I could get an Optiplex size box to replace OpenSense. Who knows? Who knows? This is the fun of home labbing, right? It's it, we're just we're never done. We're just between upgrades. That's always the joke in my mind, at least. I hope you find it funny too. So. Until the next video, at least, which there's been a couple of these vloggy style ones in a row now, haven't there? Maybe there'll be one more. I don't know. Well, until the next video, thank you so much for watching. I've been Alex from KTZ Systems.